Keystone projects are overarching assignments which enable students to show mastery of broad areas of study corresponding to the program-specific objectives of the Bachelor of Theology program. Students are required to complete all Keystone projects by the end of their final year. One of these Keystone projects is a public lecture on a theme either drawn from one or more of the following areas in general studies, history, literature, science, comparative religion, or philosophy, or on a topic of personal interest to the student. This particular assignment is designed to fulfill the following two program-specific objectives, such that the student demonstrates an appreciation of the role of Christianity, and especially the Orthodox Church, in the historical, intellectual, cultural development of mankind, and an understanding of the world around us from an Orthodox Christian perspective. The student selects a suitable topic in consultation with faculty members who work with the student in a mentoring capacity, helping him or her to refine the topic, to structure the lecture, to ensure clarity of presentation, and to generate suitable audiovisual resources. Although the public lecture is not intended to be specifically theological in nature, the student is expected to expound on his or her topic within the broader context of orthodox theology and to set forth the ramifications of the topic for contemporary church life. This keystone assignment also affords a student an excellent opportunity to demonstrate his or her communication skills, which he or she will be able to put to good use in the future when serving the church in a clerical or teaching capacity. The title of Theodora's lecture this evening is, again, The Painted Monasteries of Moldavia, History and Harmonious Theme. So I invite Theodora to come to the podium. <coughs> Vlogite your eminence, vlogite fathers and mothers, and good evening everyone. Thank you all for coming. The topic of my lecture tonight is going to be the Painted Monasteries of Northern Moldavia. I'm enrolled in the Iconography Certificate Program here at the seminary, and in the fall semester, um, Mother Justina presented us with the opportunity of being able to choose our topic uh, to present um, in our class. Uh, something relating with iconography that was interest, uh, interesting to us. And I chose to present on these same painted monasteries. Um, in that presentation, I mainly focused on uh, iconographical, the iconographical program of these exterior, exterior frescoes. But tonight, I wanted to present on more than just icono the, iconogra the iconographical program, uh, but also the history and the story behind these unique churches. I hope you all find it as fascinating as I do, and I hope you enjoy. Um, and so this will be a brief outline of uh, what I will be talking about. Um, I will go over an early Romanian, um, I will go over the history of early Romania, and uh, specifically the Principality of Moldavia, which is going to be of our focus. Um, I will t speak about some voivodes, but specifically uh, Stephen the Great. Uh, I will also be speaking about the struggle against Ottoman attacks um, that the Moldavian people had suffered. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the erection of these painted churches um, uh, in northern Moldavia. Some architectural theme themes, iconographical themes. And lastly, I will just point out a few of the reasons why they were built. Um, you know, teaching the faithful. Uh, they were also helped against the protection of invaders and obviously the preservation of the faith. Since ancient times, the Romanian lands have always been inhabited. There were a few tribes that populated what we know as present-day Romania. The Dacians, the Jets, and the Thracians. There were also a few Greek colonies that were established on the coast of the Black Sea. These tribes were not united until there was a ruler by the name of Burabista. He united these tribes and founded the Kingdom of Dacia. The kingdom, this Kingdom of Dacia was beginning to look like a powerful threat to the Roman Empire. So Julius Caesar actually was preparing an expedition uh, against this Dacian Kingdom. The kingdom soon became fragmented after the death of Burabista and in that same year that was the expedition was planned. So Dacia was no longer a threat to the Roman Empire and the expedition was canceled. 
As Rome was trying to extend its influence, they sought to expand south of the Danube River, uh, which is uh, crosses through uh, Wallachia and Moldavia. And this is where the Roman Empire, or the Roman ruler, surprisingly encountered a new king, King Decebal, who was north of the Danube River. Now, the Roman Emperor Trajan had begun to lead expeditions to this land that did, in fact, result in the conquest of Dacia and its transformation into a Roman province. And it was so for 165 years. This led to a new Dacian Roman people. Of course, this led to the adoption of Roman language and customs. This is why the Romanian language is one of the Romance languages now. Geographically, Romania is not near any other Romance language speaking countries. So we can see the Romanian language as a result of this conquest. After the subside of barbarian invasion in the 10th century, there appeared small Romanian state formations. Though they were not unified, they continued to be um, in alliance with each other. But by the end of the 13th century, the first Romanian principality was formed, which was called Wallachia. By the middle of the next century, another principality was formed, the principality which was bordered by the Carpathian Mountains and the Black Sea, which was Moldavia. These two principalities played a big role in the trade routes since they linked Central Europe to the Black Sea. The third Romanian principality had its own individual identity, but was under the, under the control of, Hungarian, of the Hungarian kingdom in the 11th century, which was the Principality of Transylvania. Although the Romanians lived in three separate principalities in the Middle Ages, political, economical, and cultural ties were never interrupted between the three. For tonight's lecture, the Principality of Moldavia is, the most interest, is of most interest to us, and I will give a brief background of how the Principality of Moldavia was founded. Historical traditions mention a Romanian nobleman from Maramuresh by the name of Dragos Voda went hunting with a group of his faithful subjects and arrived in Moldavia, therefore becoming the founder of this principality. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> they were hunting for a certain type of cattle that is now extinct, an auroch. The head of this animal became the main symbol of this new principality, and you can still find this symbol today. So although this chronicle might not sound very accurate, we do know that a nobleman from Maramuresh, which is nor the nor northern Transylvania, by the name of Dragos Voda did rule over this region of northern Moldavia in the middle of the 14th century under a Hungarian king. The Kingdom of Hungary and Poland were always fighting over this area because of its great geographical location. Moldavia would often shift alliances between the two to maintain autonomy of the country. Toward the end of the 14th century, a metropolis was established in Moldavia by the Byzantines. This led to the recognition of the principality authority in Moldavia and led to its independence and to the preservation of the Orthodox faith. In the early Middle Ages, Voivod was the title for military leaders, um, although in Romania it's mostly used for uh, the princes of the region. Stefan cel Mare, or otherwise known as Stephen the Great, the greatest prince of the Middle Ages, was the son of Bogdan II and grandson of Alexander the Good. Born between 1433 and 1440, we are not sure, as a young <clears throat> Born between 1433 and 1440, we are not sure. As a young man during the reign of his father, the year of 1450, Stephen got to participate in a, success, in a successful battle against the Poles alongside his cousin Vlad Sepish, or otherwise known as Vlad the Impaler. Participating in this battle gave Stephen military experience that he would later use. The year following this battle, Stephen's father was assassinated which led the young Stephen into exile. In the time of his exile, Stephen lived in both Transylvania and Wallachia, then <clears throat> the other two principalities of Romania for a little over five years. The Principality of Moldavia was in great civil strife for a long time, since the reign of his grandfather, Alexander the Good, to be specific. In 
It did not go away until Stephen's accession to the Moldavian throne. His ascension was made possible with the help of his cousin Vlad, who had just become the prince of Wallachia. His cousin provided him with military assistance to invade Moldavia and seize the throne again. Stephen came into power in 1457. This was very close after the fall of Constantinople, which was in 1453. The people of Moldavia were very joyous, although they all had been weakened by the civil strife and other internal struggles they had as a principality. As a ruler of small, <clears throat> as a ruler of a small principality, surrounded by bigger kingdoms who had great power, he always managed with great skill to play one off the, against the other, and joined alliances with whomever was most useful to him. At the moment, <clears throat> to gain. <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, as a ruler of a small principality surrounded by bigger kingdoms who had great power, he always managed with great skill to play one off against the other and joined alliances with whomever was most useful to him at the moment to gain advantages for his principality. Stephen had the Hungarians to the west, Poles to the north, Mongols to the east, and Ottomans to the south that he always had to worry about. Stephen was amazing on the battlefield. He was, very <clears throat> he was a very canny operator. He was so well known in history for the battles he won and all, other, all of his building efforts. He was also known as a tireless builder, building fortresses, churches, monuments, and restoring his princely seat with these deeds. In this way, he, made, he was never forgotten. <clears throat> After every battle he won, he would build a church. There is record of a total of 44 churches, although only 32 of them have actually been identified. Pope Sixtus IV called him the Athlete of Christ after one of his victories that reached the Vatican. Stephen the Great died July 2nd, 1504, after reigning 47 years, and he fought all these 47 years. He would have been 64 around 64 to 71, because we are not sure of the date of his birth. Was, this was the longest reign of any ruler ever had in the Romanian history. He was buried in the Putna Monastery, one of the many churches he built, and Stephen became and still remains a symbol to the Romanian people of, the proud, of their proud heritage. A famous Romanian poet, Mihai Eminescu, wrote a poem about St. Stephen. Um, about Stephen the Great. Rise, O Stephen, mighty prince, from sacred Putna come hence. Let the holy pre prelacy guard alone the monastery. Let the saints and their deeds in the trust of pious priests. Let them ring the bell with might all the day and all the night. And may mercy grant thee, Lord, redeem thy people from the horde. He was in fact ranked number one in the top 100 most influential uh, people of Romania and the Church of Romania was has venerated him as a saint uh, since 1992 nine, saint, since 1992 so the Moldavian area struggled uh, greatly against the Ottomans um, Romania's geographical placement as we mentioned is the gateway to Europe there are ports many trading routes from the Danube River and the Black Sea, lying at the crossroads of power, powerful empires. During the first decade of Stephen's reign, he wanted peace with the Ottomans, so he continued paying tribute as his predecessors did. In 1470s, Stephen began an anti-Ottoman policy where he no longer paid tribute to the Ottomans and refused to present himself to Mehmed II. This Mehmed the second was the same Mehmed that conquered Constantinople in 1453. The Ottomans were knocking on the door. Stephen the Great strove to fortify the routes along which he knew the enemy would try to advance. But the fog of war lay thick in every Moldavian valley by the Ottoman sultans. In 1457, we have the Battle of Vaslui, or otherwise known as Podul and Alt, which is High Bridge. 
Solomon Pasha was ordered to assemble an army attack on Moldavia. An Ottoman army of 100,000 men began to invade. The Moldavian army was made up of an army less than 40,000 soldiers. The Moldavian army did have some help from, um, <clears throat> from the Polish people, um, but this was not much uh, compared to the Ottomans. Though Stephen was not worried, knowing he would use advanced tactics against them, as the Ottomans entered Moldavia, they only came across empty villages and no resources. Stephen made sure that all the people and livestock were relocated. They continued to progress throughout the country. The battlefield was very foggy, being an advantage to the Moldavians for knowing their own land and a disadvantage to the Ottomans. The Moldavians first sent out musicians in the middle of the valley, playing their drums and bugles. They tricked their opponents into thinking the whole entire army was ready for battle. As Solomon Pasha told the army to advance, the Moldavians were then able to proceed with their tactics. The Moldavians, using light cavalry, were able to make hit-and-run attacks on them. They were also able to fire arches from three different directions. Stephen's real army had not even gotten involved, yet as they were hiding on top of a foggy hill overlooking the battlefield. As the real army made its way, the Ottomans began thinking they were being attacked from three different sides and began to retreat back. Solomon, Pasha, <clears throat> Solomon Pasha lost control of his army, and although he was trying to regain control as the battle lasted four days, he was forced to signal a retreat. Stephen the Great crushed the army of Sultan Mehmed II in the Battle of Vaslui. This invasion had been the worst defeat ever experienced by the Ottomans. <clears throat> the Moldavian prince announced the victory of <clears throat> the Moldavian prince announced the victory to all the Christian Europe. We have defeated them and brought them underfoot and put them to the sword for which God must be praised. Stephen the Great <clears throat> was trying to preserve Christianity not only in Moldavia but also in Europe. He was trying his best to protect the European Christian borders. He asked for help from the kings of the West, knowing that the Ottomans would be back. He did not receive much help, but did receive words of encouragement from Pope Sixtus IV, as we mentioned, uh, calling him the Athlete of Christ. There are some other accounts that say Stephen fasted 40 days after this battle on bread and water alone, instead of celebrating his victory. And he did not let anyone attribute the victory to him, but to God alone. The Ottomans came back to the Mo <clears throat> the Ottomans came back to Moldova the next year, in 1476, and the Ottomans won. But instead, they struck a deal with Moldavia, and Moldavia began to pay tribute again. Stephen the Great fought 36 battles against the Ottomans, and he won 34 of them. For the rest of Moldavian history, they would continue fighting off or paying tribute to the Ottomans, but never fully conquered by them. After every battle won, Stephen would build a church. The voyevodes after him also took on to this tradition. We could attribute most of these beautiful painted churches to four patrons, Stephen the Great, his Ill illegitimate son Petru Radish, the Movila brothers, and Alexander Lapushnil. Le <clears throat> because of their religious beliefs and cultural inclinations, they also, <clears throat> they also uh, put a mark on their uh, official leaders and other, others of high ranks to do the same. And um, <clears throat> this is how we have so many of these painted churches. Stephen's illegitimate son, Petru Radish, who ruled Moldavia from 1527 to 1538, and again from 1541 to 1546, prompted a new vision for the churches of Moldavia. He commissioned artists to cover the interiors and exteriors with elaborate frescoes. Portraits of saints and prophets, scenes from the life of Christ and the Old Testament. These churches were built starting from the late 15th century to the late 16th century. 
Their external walls covered in fresco paintings are masterpieces inspired by Byzantine art. These churches are very authentic and cannot be found anywhere else in the world. They're also particularly well-preserved. They embody a unique and homogeneous artistic phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> Suchevica, Moldevica, Voronets, Humor, Suchava, Patruzia, Al Arbore, and Probata, these eight monasteries, including the Monastery of Moldovica, were placed in the UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage List in 1993 and are preserved by, by them. <clears throat> these churches hold not only historical significance, but also artistical and theological significance. These churches show a history of Moldavian people who fought for the preservation of the faith in the face of the invaders. The voivodes did not build them for their own glory, but rather for the glory of God. You can tell that they did this because the placement of these churches. They are not in prominent areas. They're in um, secluded areas near the mountains. They are more in the countryside <coughs> and other like places. These churches are really unique to this area of Moldova. There really isn't any other church like these in other parts of the world. The main color of this church is blue, and a deep secret lies in this blue. It cannot be replicated. Um, it doesn't matter how many times scientists try to replicate this blue, they, blue, they cannot. Um, so this is something that's very special to Voronets. Um, and one of its most known icons is the Last Judgment, which is on uh, the back wall on the exterior, uh, and it's very well preserved. So I'll be going over a few of these painted monasteries and just giving kind of a brief um, description to them. The Voronets mon Monastery, possibly the most famous church of Romania, also known as the Sistine Chapel of the East, was founded by Stephen the Great in 1488. Stephen the Great built this church for his spiritual advisor, Daniel the Hermit. Um, he actually uh, went to Daniel the Hermit uh, before his Battle of Vaslui and asked for his help and for his prayers. So <clears throat> um, there are other accounts that say that he fulfilled his promise to Daniel the Hermit in building him this this monastery so that he could be closer to him in Suchava and commemorate his victory at Vaslui. Um, this church is also dedicated to St. George, the bringer of victory in battle. An inscription placed above the original entrance, now in the exonorthex, says, I, Prince Stephen, by God's mercy, leading the country of Moldavia, son of Prince Bogdan, started to build this foundation at the monastery of Fortonets dedicated to the saint and great martyr and victorious George. In the year 1488, month, the month of May 26, the Monday after the descent of the Holy Spirit, and completed in that same year in the month of September 14th. This means that this church was built in less than four months. The exterior was painted in 1535, painted by uh, 20 unknown monks, um, identical in style to uh, one of the other eight churches, um, except this mm -hmm. church uh, then began, uh, was built in exonarthics attached to it. Next, I'll be going over the monastery of Suchevica. The Church of the Lord's Resurrection was built by a woman who... Uh, the original building was built by a woman for over 30 years. She was carrying um, an ox cart and hauling bricks. Um, this present church was built by the Movila brothers, Yeremia and Simeon, between 1582 and 1584. Yeremia became ruler of Moldavia as his brother Simeon reigned in Valachia. They also had another brother, uh, George, who during that period became Metropolitan of Moldavia. It was considered to be the last of the exterior fresco churches that was associated with Stephen the Great and Petru Radish. 
The Movila brothers most likely did this to show that they were from the royal lin lineage of Stephen the Great. Painted nearly half a century after all the other churches in 1595, it also holds the same structure, the triconch plan that Stephen the Great was known for. In 1595 and 1606, open porches and defense towers and walls were added. It took 10 months to a year to paint the entire exterior of this church. Almost intact and has undergone little to no um, significant alterations in the course of its history. <clears throat> What's uh, particular to this monastery uh, is the descent, uh, the ladder of divine ascent, which can be seen, cannot be seen anywhere else in this size and in this sort of depiction. <clears throat> the ladder is unique in size and representation. Uh, having a ladder that's going diagonal and the bottom is very chaotic as for the top is very systematic and orderly. One of the main colors of this church is red. Um, and as we see, each church does have a particular main color. So this, this the color of this church is red. Um, another very specific thing to Suchavita, they have the life it has the life of St. Pahomios, um, and this is due to the monastic community uh, having a great reverence to St. Pahomios. Um, they have his life in different registrars uh, on the other side of the church. The last monastery I'll be going over um, is Moldovica, first constructed by Alexander the Good, who was the grandfather of Stephen the Great. Um, but it seems to have been destroyed by an earthquake. So it was rebuilt by Petru Radish, who was the son of Stephen the Great, several hundred meters uphill from its original site um, because the original site was too close to the river. <clears throat> it was the church's original, uh, the church was built in 1532 and it's dedicated to the Feast of the Annunciation. This church, what's unique about it is uh, it was painted by an iconographer um, whose name we do know. His name was uh, Toma, and he was very well known in Moldavia. He actually painted um, the Humor Monastery before this one, uh, also on the exterior, but he had a lot of trouble in finding the exact recipe to make the paints last for the Humor Monastery. So after taking some time, he ended up perfecting and making the paint long-lasting for, for Moldavica. Moldavica is said to be one of the oldest monasteries, and the main, uh, main color of this church is, um, is a yellow or orange color. Um, the Sage of Constantinople, the icon of the Sage of Constantinople, is well-preserved at this monastery. And the exterior fres frescoes are some of the best preserved out of all the Moldavian churches. There are different stylistic differences between some of the icons, but this only means that there were multiple iconographers and probably at different times. I'll be going over now some architectural themes between all of these uh, churches. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some great patrons that are known for the the erection of these monasteries, uh, Stephen the Great, Petru Radish, the Movila brothers, and Alexander Lapushno. Um, they needed um, these rulers, although they uh, built these beautiful churches, needed great skills uh, of um, mason, masons and builders and craftsmen and artists to bring the instruction of the princes and nobles to fruition. Uh, massive stone fortresses capable of uh, handling anything, whether it would be an attack of invaders and to preserve the faith. Uh, the church has this uh, triconch plan that shows that has uh, it has three apse in the at the front of the church. Um, 
Uh, the churches built by nobles always had towers and stone walls surrounding the churches. Stephen the Great, when he began to build churches, he supplemented with workers from Transylvania and recruited for their expert knowledge of decoration and design. The requirements for the chur these churches were that the form and layout of the churches meet the needs of the Orthodox Church and linked to Byzantine tradition. Um, <clears throat> the, there is a, we see this in all of our Orthodox churches. We have an altar, we have a nave, but here we also have a, uh, something they call a pronaos. They also call the nave naos. So um, we have the altar, the naos, the pronaos. And then because these churches were built by um, rulers and noblemen, they wanted a place of honor for burial and they were actually buried inside the churches so the following room is called the tomb room or the burial room and then it's followed by uh, a narthex or exonarthex um, a lot of these churches obviously are uh, very byzantine in style but do have some slavonic influence um, especially when you look at iconography, uh, it's the inscriptions are written in Slavonic most of the time. And also, um, there was a great influence of um, medieval and Gothic design with buttresses and um, the different styles of windows. And then instead of a round dome, which is usually found in Orthodox churches, they have a sort of lantern shape, uh, a lantern shaped tower on top of each church. So uh, some iconographical themes of these churches, um, they all have a catechetical and a liturgical zone. The closer to the entrance of the church, we have the catechetical zone where uh, many of the faithful would learn. This is where we have scenes of the Old Testament, um, lives of saints, um, <clears throat> uh, the Akathist hymn to the Mother of God. And then as we go towards the altar, as we progress towards the altar, we have the liturgical zone. Um, and we have the hierarchy of all the saints. <clears throat> Uh, the three components that are found in all the churches in Moldavia are the Akathis hymn, the Roots of Jesse, and the Choir of All the Saints. Um, religious paintings from medieval times cannot be understood without the theological message. <clears throat> uh, and an art critic once said, there is truth to this formula of being painted with um, great color um, that being painted with great color would bring awareness and uh, recognition to these uh, churches. But this art critic says there is truth to this formula, but as in, as in all artistic endeavors, the result in triumph, the real secret lies in the minds and hearts of the people who built them. Um, <clears throat> another thing to be noted is, uh, although there were different iconographers that painted each monastery, uh, they uh, followed a canonical iconographic program, although they interpreted the scene slightly different using different colors and um, maybe different um, <coughs> other notable mm, scenes. Um, as I said, they described the biblical stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the life of the Mother of God, um, patrons of the area, and man's beginning, um, and uh, man's life after death. So one of the icons that are seen in all the churches is the Akathis hymn icon. As we know, we have the service of the Akathis hymn to the Mother of God. The service was written in the year Constantinople was saved by the Persian attack by St. Romanos, the Melodis. There are 24 kontakion in the Akathis hymn, so there are 24 scenes in this icon. And the scenes match up with the kontakion in the icons. Uh, 
the scenes match up with the contagion in the service. Um, these 24 scenes are usually painted in, a, in four horizontal registers. The first 12 come from the historical stanzas of the Akathisim that recount the birth of Christ, the Annunciation, the Conception, the Virgin Mary meets Saint Elizabeth, the Doubting Joseph, the Birth of Christ, the Way of the Three Magis to Bethlehem, the Adoration of the Magi, the Return of the Three Magi, the Flight to Egypt, and the Preservation of Jesus at the Temple. The end of this scenes, uh, the end of uh, this icon usually has a depiction of the Sage of Constantinople. The Akathis hymn continually asks for the intercession and protection for, from the Mother of God. So again, this depiction of the Sage of Constantinople depicts the preservation of Constantinople, whom was being attacked by the Persians. It was most likely painted for the hope and prayers of the Moldavian people that she would also intercede and help Moldova, which was constantly trying to be, which was constantly invaded by the Ottomans and other invaders. When we look at the dates of this icon, <clears throat> when we look at the dates of this icon, we actually see that it was painted less than a hundred years from the fall of Constantinople. There are some thoughts that the exterior iconographical plan was just for a political reason, um, being anti-Ottoman. But really this idea is not true because there are a lot more, um, there are other icons that have nothing to do with Ottomans um, and are not limited to uh, what Moldavia was dealing with um, in, politically. Um, Uh, we, we can just see that the Moldavians did want the intercessions of the Mother of God just as she protected Constantinople during the attack of the Persians. We also have now the roots of Jesse. Um, the depiction of the roots of Jesse were not common till the late 12th century. This idea of religious art depicting trees with stems and branches growing upwards uh, with flower buds that are had originally <clears throat> with flower buds that are ornamented, had originated in Iran and other countries surrounding that area. It was also uh, seen in Greek mythology. Um, but we see this idea of trees um, in the scriptures, specifically the Psalms. We hear many references to trees that flourish and bringeth forth fruit. The righteous will flourish like the palm, will grow like the cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flower in the courts of our God. The tree of Jesse is meant to depict the links between the Old and New Testament and the lineage of Christ from Jesse, the father of King David. <clears throat> and this we also hear from the prophecies of Isaiah. In this icon, we have Jesse with a branch sprouting from his side. This branch then is beautifully decorated and ornamented and springs out. When looking at the layout of the icon, we see it has seven horizontal registers and 14 vertical registers. Below or on the sides of this icon, we can see the depiction of ancient philosophers. There are a few reasons for this. Um, <clears throat> there are a few reasons for this uh, coming to be. Before the time of Christ, uh, there were the ancient philosophers were known as the forerunners um, because of their teachings of their sense of reason and justice. Um, they were also uh, viewed as very uh, as the most learned of antiquity, and monasteries were also seen as a place of um, of knowledge. Uh, the monastics were probably the most learned of the times, um, and people would go to monasteries not only to pray, but also to learn. The monasteries were places in which the faithful, uh, they were the first schools. So we do have philosophers 
uh, depicted Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and uh, a few others. And then we have the prayer of all the saints. Um, this is uh, in the liturgical zone of uh, the exterior. Um, the saints in each generation join to those who have gone before it and filled like them with light. Became, <clears throat> they become a gold chain in which each saint is separate, is a separate link, united to neck, united to the next by faith, works, and love. So in the one God they form a single chain which cannot quickly be broken, uh, says Saint Simeon. That Saint Simeon, the new theologian which uh, definitely describes um, the prayer of all the saints. Seeing the depiction of so many saints um, that struggled for their faith and the life, <clears throat> the life in Christ that they lived was a great reassurance to the Moldavian people and an example of truth that really mattered to them. It is always found on the outside of where the altar would be, <clears throat> uh, where the three apps are, asps are located. Different churches have varying registers, but we can more than often uh, view that they, from top to bottom they have angels, prophets, apostles, missionary saints, hierarchs, martyrs, and then monastics. All these registers lead the eye to the middle of the front of the church where we see the mother of God and we also see um, uh, in, in this particular one we see uh, Christ as the Eucharist um, but other other churches have a lamb um, and this shows the communication between the inside and outside of the church we also see depicted on all of these churches the lives of soldier saints um, we can see that this probably comforted the voyevods, um, and they obviously asked for the entreaties of these soldier saints. Um, we will see, we will usually see St. Demetrius, St. Mercury, St. Uh, George, and other like uh, military saints. They're always depicted on horses. And some churches actually have their whole uh, lives uh, depicted in different registers on, on other sides of the church. These churches are the most unique and hold great amount of history and value that cannot be found elsewhere. And so I just wanted to go over uh, and point out a few main values these churches provided the Moldavian people. There is a great catechetical purpose to these churches these churches taught the people. As we mentioned, monasteries were the places where people would go to not only pray, but to learn as well as they were the first schools. From the interior to the exterior, the frescoes prompted or promoted orthodoxy and educated the illiterate. The iconography cannot be understood without knowing uh, the deep theological messages. We can see that they took great thought in the, er, their arrangement of the iconographical program. Um, for example, the Akathist hymn is always adjacent to the roots of Jesse, and this was not um, placed next to each other for uh, no reason. But seeing them side by side, um, it combats uh, a great heresy uh, that the church uh, <clears throat> dealt with uh, in its early beginnings, Arianism. We can recognize the two natures of Christ by seeing these two icons side by side. The Akathis hymn representing the divine nature of Christ and the roots of Jesse representing the um, uh, human nature of Christ. And this is also seen by the color choices. The Akathis hymn is more, mostly adorned with the red color, which is, represents the divine, and the roots of Jesse is mostly adorned with a blue color which represents humanity. Many of these churches also have a bench, a sort of bench aligning the exterior of the monasteries where it would give a place for the faithful to sit and ponder and pray and look at these beautiful icons. These churches also served uh, a purpose um, 
uh, as defense against the invaders, um, the invocations of the Mother of God and all the saints, from the angels to the prophets to warrior saints and martyrs, are very clear on these um, on this iconographical program. Some may say, as I mentioned, that these frescoes are purely political, but we can't say that because there are many other icons that have nothing to do with the anti-Ottomans, being anti-Ottoman. We do see that this was on the mind of the voyevodes since they had, in fact, the, since they had to face them very often, but we can tell that the voyevodes had greater faith in the church and were not fallen with fear because of the Ottomans. These churches were also, <clears throat> these churches also served as places for retreat of the Moldavian people. This is why they have big brick walls and watchtowers surrounding each church. And lastly, the preservation of the Orthodox faith in the land of Moldavia. Um, these churches were built for the preservation of the faith and they still continue to do so. All of these monasteries, although open for the public and our tourist attractions, are still in use by uh, monastic communities, uh, holding services and other, um, and other of the like. They were not built for the glory of the, vo of the voyevodes, but rather for the glory of God. Thank you for listening.